Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. We'd like um, to welcome you to this special Saturday night. Uh, my name is uh, Mohammed Hazazi. I'm a consultant, a better retina surgeon in National Guard Hospital. And also I'd like, I would like also to introduce my colleague and actually my classmate, Dr. Adel Akili. Uh, he's a clinical assistant professor and a member of the retinal uh, division in Kekesh. At this uh, special night, uh, myself and on behalf of my colleague, Dr. Akili, would like to uh, welcome you to a very special meeting, actually, tonight where the uh, uh, an outside, outstanding uh, retina specialist will meet on the same, around the table with their uh, reputable mentors who have uh, a very uh, long experience in the field of retina. Uh, actually, they will be uh, sharing, delivering, and uh, passing the uh, message to the, uh, all the audience, uh, including the new uh, retina colleagues. Uh, let me introduce the panelists. Uh, we have uh, our uh, mentor, and actually, uh, he is always a friend and mentor, Dr. Ahmad Aboud. He is a senior academic consultant uh, at I Institute. He was uh, uh, known uh, Kekesh uh, staff for uh, decades before he uh, went to. Uh, Cleveland uh, Clinic, where he spent uh, years there. Uh, I would like to welcome him again to one of the uh, actually uh, meetings today. Welcome to the Ahmad. The uh, second uh, well-known reputable uh, speaker is Dr. Hassan Adibi. He is also a senior academic consultant and vitro retina and uveitis. Uh, uh, consultant in King Khaled Eye Special Hospital in Riyadh. The, uh, the third uh, panelist is Dr. Saad Dahmash. He's an associate professor and consultant to uh, Vitro Retina uh, Division in College of Medicine and KSU. And uh, last and not least is Dr. Abdel Kahtani, also a known assistant, a professor, and retina specialist in VITIS and Oncology, Ocular Oncology in King Saad University. Uh, King Saad bin Abdelaziz is actually a university in, in Jeddah, uh, in National Guard Hospital. So uh, I would like uh, just uh, like announcement for all, all the audience, if you can kindly place your uh, questions and any inquiry to pass it uh, to our uh, expert uh, panelist in the uh, Q&A uh, box. Uh, before I hand it over to you, uh, Dr. Akili. I would like also to extend my appreciation and gratitude to our colleagues and Saudi Ophthalmology Society for arranging this meeting and making this happen. So without uh, any further ado, I would just hand it to you, uh, Dr. Akili, to introduce our uh, guest uh, speakers. If you can kindly, Dr. Akili. Thank you. Uh, uh, first of all, uh, thank you, Dr. Hazazi. Uh, our, uh, uh, four uh, talks will be presented by uh, some of our brightest uh, fellows in, in, in uh, medical and surgical retina. And the first talk will be by uh, Dr. Mohammed Atebi. He will be presenting uh, about endophthalmitis review and current, uh, current evaluation. Uh, Dr. Mohammed Atebi, the mic is yours. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Adel. Uh, first of all, uh, good evening, everyone. And, and I would like to thank the organizing uh, committee for the kind invitation. And uh, I'm very humbled and, and extremely honored to present this talk uh, with uh, uh, one of uh, you know, uh, the best mentors in the field. I'll be talking about uh, endophthalmitis as well uh, as a review and the current evaluation and what we know so far. And uh, we'll start by a simple definition of endophthalmitis. As we all know that endophthalmitis is a period inflammation of the eye uh, uh, to an infection. And this infection can be categorized based on the uh, uh, route of uh, entry of the organism into the eye, either exogenous endophthalmitis or endogenous endophthalmitis. 
Exogenous endothelitis simply means that there is a break within the eye, uh, outer wall of the eye that allows the organism to travel from the outside environment into the eye uh, for growth and replication and can be further classified into acute postoperative, uh, chronic postoperative, uh, filtering blip associated, as well as post intravitreal injection, uh, as well as non uh, uh, procedural, such as traumatic and keratitis associated. And endogenous endothelitis simply means that there is a source of infection within the body uh, from which the pathogen travels all the way to uh, reach the eye. And uh, uh, this uh, simple classification allows us to uh, predict uh, the most likely organism involved in the infection. For example, in acute post-op, we think of coagulase negative. In chronic post-op, we think of uh, P acne. Uh, and in blip-related uh, endothelitis, we think of streptococcus and haemophilus influenza. And the list goes on. And we'll go through this uh, in the presentation. So we'll start off with the acute postoperative endophthalmitis. Uh, as we all know, it usually starts within the first uh, few days of surgery and can be uh, up to uh, two weeks of, of surgery. And we can't really talk about uh, postoperative endophthalmitis without mentioning the endophthalmitis vitrectomy study uh, uh, that provided uh, helpful information uh, by including patients with endophthalmitis after cataract surgery or secondary intraocular lens implant. Uh, and we know that around 94% of culture confirmed cases uh, involved uh, uh, are gram positive bacteria. So what are the risk factors of uh, uh, postoperative endophthalmitis? Uh, uh, we can classify it into pre-op. This include uh, diabetes, as well as chronic blepharitis, infection of the nasolacrimal duct system, as well as intraoperative reasons. These include uh, prolonged surgery, vitreous loss, as well as uh, uh, posterior capsular rupture. And postoperative risk factors include wound leak and vitreous incarceration. So what are the differential diagnoses? Uh, we know that uh, uh, top of the differential include toxic anterior segment syndrome, although the major differentiating uh, features include little or no pain, uh, symptoms starting uh, 12 hours to 48 hours after the surgery, diffuse limbus to limbus corneal edema, uh, no or minimal posterior segment inflammation. And the second uh, differential diagnosis would be the non-infectious inflammatory endophthalmitis associated commonly with the injection of the standard formulation of triamcinolone acetonide uh, uh, due to the preservative and the vehicle containing the medication. Uh, again, the differentiating factors include crystals of varying size, uh, hypopenis, chalky white, and shifts with head tilt, no lid swelling, good red reflex, and no to mild pain and absence of fibrin. Now, other differential diagnoses include lens-induced inflammation as well as uh, anterior veitis and keratitis that can be differentiated from uh, uh, infectious endophthalmitis by uh, history and physical examination. So what are the symptoms of acute post-op endophthalmitis? Uh, we know that around 94% of patients report blurring vision, 82% uh, report uh, red eye, uh, as well as uh, pain in 74%, keeping in mind that around 25% of endophthalmitis cases or patients uh, did not have pain and 34% uh, report uh, swollen lids. So what are the signs of endophthalmitis? We know that anterior uh, chamber cells uh, uh, are a sign of endophthalmitis as well as fibrinous reaction, vitreous inflammation and retinitis, as well as uh, retinal periflebitis, and then hypopian and hazy media. So acute post-op uh, endophthalmitis occur after cataract surgery rate between 0.08% to 0.68%, and the highest risk is after secondary intraocular lens implant as well, uh, and the lowest risk is after pars plana vitrectomy. Uh, this is because that the vitreous acts as a culture medium for the microorganism, uh, microorganism uh, to grow in. We can't really talk about uh, post-cataract endophthalmitis without mentioning uh, uh, the famous study done uh, uh, back in 2007 uh, and published by Eskers. Uh, they uh, looked at the uh, efficacy of giving intracameral antibiotics in four different uh, study groups, and they found that giving intracameral cefroxime uh, decreases the risk of endophthalmitis uh, by five folds compared to no intracameral cefroxime. Next up is chronic postoperative endophthalmitis. Uh, usually it manifests several weeks and can occur after months of the surgery. It is less common than the acute variety and the organism uh, is isolated are less virulent bacteria and fungi, 63% uh, P acne, 16% staph epidermis, and 16% candida species. Now the clinical features of chronic postop endophthalmitis includes the famous white intracapsular plaque, uh, it is a, a form of gametous inflammation that is steroid responsive 
uh, but recurs after uh, tapering steroid, uh, pain and discomfort as well as hypopian uh, may be absent. Uh, now I'll talk about fl uh, filtering blip associated endophthalmitis, which occurs in about 0.2 to 9.6% of glaucoma filtering procedure and can uh, uh, occur in a range uh, of three to nine years after the glaucoma surgery. Uh, the incidence of this uh, type of infection increases with uh, blip leak, inferior or nasal blip, high blip, use of antifibrotic agents, trabeculectomy alone compared to combined procedure as well as chronic antibiotic use. Now I'd like to talk about uh, the most uh, uh, common procedure that we do in, the, in our practice, which is intravitreal injection. Uh, endophthalmitis occurs both inje injection in rate between uh, one in uh, 2,000 to one in 3,000. We know that the most common organism is staph epi, and we also know that strip verdins is three times higher uh, after intravitreal injection compared to other uh, surgical intervention. And that uh, the reason is uh, that uh, strep verdins is highly abundant in the oral flora. So knowing that, we can say that masks on as well as no talking policy during the intravitreal injection uh, are associated with less risk of endophthalmitis, including those from oral flora. Pre-filled syringes are associated with a reduced rate of culture positive endophthalmitis including from oral flora as, as stated in these studies. Now, does topical antibiotic prophylaxis help uh, to prevent uh, post-injection endophthalmitis? Uh, the DRCR network did a study uh, uh, many years ago and they found that it was not helpful. And more or later studies looked into that in more detail, including this study that was conducted in more than 117,000 intravitreal injection. And not only that it was useless, it was also associated with an increased incidence of both suspected and culture cases, and uh, also increased uh, resistance given that patients receive uh, intravitreal injection antib antibiotic on uh, monthly or multiple uh, uh, episodes in the year. So what works best to decrease the uh, endophthalmitis after injection? Nothing works better than iodine. This was shown uh, uh, more than 30 years ago by speaker uh, to decrease the risk of endophthalmitis after in uh, ophthalmic surgery. Uh, and it is inexpensive and widely available. Uh, and everyone likes iodine except uh, definitely the patient. Uh, as we see in the practice, they complain of irritation, redness, and foreign body sensation. So what are the things that might increase the risk of endothelitis? We know from uh, reported uh, studies that lidocaine gel was confirmed to, to be a barrier uh, to antisepsis when administered prior to bovidone iodine. And uh, a more recent study published in 2019 that was conducted in more than 154,000 uh, intravitreal injection. Uh, and they conducted the multivariant logistic regression on the different uh, risk factors of endothelitis. And they certainly did find that use of lidocaine gel may increase the risk of endothelitis after the injection. So many studies also looked on, on different ways to go around this, and they found that uh, either uh, putting iodine before and after applying the gel or uh, uh, switching to subconjunctival in, uh, lidocaine uh, injection. Now I'll talk about traumatic endophthalmitis. Uh, it is responsible for about 25% of cases uh, and it occurs after open uh, globe injury about uh, uh, the chance of developing after open globe injury is 7%. And injuries with intraocular from body increases the rate up to 31%. This takes us to the risk factors of post-traumatic endophthalmitis. We know from previous studies that dirty wound, lens capsule rupture, as well as delayed presentation of more than 24 hours are, uh, and intraocular from body are associated with a uh, high risk of uh, contracting or developing post-traumatic endophthalmitis. And this is a study that was published in uh, Retina by uh, two of our favorite ophthalmologists of all time, Professor Ahmed Abul Asrar and Dr. Imad Aboud, where they describe the microbiologic spectrum of post-traumatic endophthalmitis, as well as the visual outcome in a large series of patients. Now I'll talk about endogenous endophthalmitis. As we mentioned already, that it means uh, there is a source of infection within the body from which the pathogen travels all the way to reach the eye, responsible for about 8% of cases. Uh, and it's very important for us to acquire proper history that includes immunosuppressive status, as well as history of abdominal surgery, renal failure, as well as uh, intravenous drug use and indwelling catheter. And in some cases, the history may be unremarkable, such as in our case here, uh, where abdominal imaging revealed the presence of uh, liver abscess. 
So liver abscess is the most common extraocular fossa ion infection followed by pneumonia, endocarditis, and soft tissue infection. Uh, and uh, this is uh, uh, also common uh, cause of endophthalmitis, especially in Asia and, and the Middle East. This is a conference photo of the left eye. You can appreciate the haze media due to vitritis and the tension is immediately drawn to the posterior pole where we can see multiple fluffy like ill-defined lesions uh, 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 characteristic of uh, fungal infection. So how can we diagnose endophthalmitis? We know that the diagnosis of endophthalmitis is a clinical diagnosis mainly, although ocular and systemic investigation may be of use uh, and uh, are very important in, in terms of you know, sending for gram stain, culture sensitivity, as well as uh, also doing systemic workup. So in case of endogenous endophthalmitis, we uh, need to do full investigation that includes cultures from the blood, the urine, as well as full imaging. And the difference here is that we are no more uh, dealing with an eye condition only, but rather in a systemic condition that is associated with the increased rate of mortality and morbidity. And that's why it's very important to involve other healthcare professionals in a multidisciplinary team approach. So this is a, uh, some, a few information that I gathered from Ryan's of special uh, bacteria and their characteristic. For example, in bacillus, uh, it is a bacteria that can destroy the eye within hours, uh, as well as uh, maybe associated with fever and leukocytosis. Candida uh, is a, a complication of candidemia, and that also supports the idea that we need to involve uh, uh, other healthcare professionals in the treatment of, of uh, this type of endothomitis. Uh, P. acne is exclusively found in patients with IOL, and the list goes on. B. scan is, is of great importance, especially when we have a media obesity, and findings compatible with endophthalmitis include uh, dispersed vitreous opacities, uh, chorioretinal thickening, as well as we need to assess for the presence of RD or choroidal and uh, retained foreign bodies. Forster, back in 1970, 78 uh, recognized the importance of vitreous sampling for culture. And ever since then, we know that around 30% uh, of vitreous samples may come back negative. This increased the interest in molecular diagnostic as well as PCR. And this is not a new concept and it's been there for a while. Uh, new studies have looked at the different uh, methodologies of uh, recognizing uh, DNA of, of pathogen as well as uh, PCR products to determine the genus of the bacteria. So this is a study that was published in 2019 that uh, uh, looked at the uh, compared uh, culture positive and culture negative uh, endothermitis and did PCR for them. Uh, I just uh, wanna highlight the advantages that they mentioned in the study uh, of PCR. They state that PCR will provide you with definitive diagnosis within 24 hours and you'll be able to diagnose a more rare organism. And this is just an example of the uh, uh, like report that we have in our institute. And we did in fact receive this in less than 24 hours. So this is the table that they mentioned in their study where they compared culture positive and culture negative cases. Uh, all the culture positive cases, none of them had a negative PCR, while in the culture negative uh, cases, half of them actually did yield uh, a positive PCR. Now the advent of PCR in endophthalmitis has allowed for the identification of uh, new biomarkers in endophthalmitis. Uh, uh, this includes torctinovirus, which is uh, clinically important as stated in this article here published uh, in 2020 uh, by Groba Twills and the lead of OMIC, where they stated that patients with positive PCR for torctinovirus are associated with five times higher risk of requiring parasplenic vitrectomy compared to patients with a negative PCR for uh, torctinovirus, and that was statistically significant. Thank you very much. Yes, uh, thank you, Dr. Atebi. Well prepared and nicely presented. Uh, also, uh, you know, listing all the uh, controversy area actually in terms of diagnosis. I have actually one question directed to the panelist. Uh, when you have um, like equi uh, vocal data uh, to support uh, uh, one diagnosis on top of the other, when you have a negative workup, a negative culture, does not yield any uh, organism, neither the stain nor the culture. So, what is your uh, next step in such cases? Do you 
Shall I go ahead and... And you can go. Um, well, thank you for this presentation. Uh, enjoyed it uh, thoroughly and learned from it. Uh, and thank you for the question. Um, uh, I'll be eager to hear what my uh, other uh, uh, co-panelists are going to say, but I mean, uh, usually in the context of uh, endophthalmitis and the common as being post-operative endophthalmitis, we are not going to wait for any test results um, to act uh, uh, to start the, 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 the management. And now obviously we can find ourselves in a situation afterward where it's not responding as much as we, we, as we wanted and we ask ourselves if we should re-inject or not. But um, uh, we would have already uh, managed uh, the, the case uh, and not wait for the result of any test before we intervene. I mean, obviously I'm talking here about the, the tests you are, you are, I think you have in mind in the question about uh, cultures and PCRs and so on. The other tests that we do in the clinic um, uh, to establish the diagnosis uh, and, and act on it, those are, uh, there is no, no controversy on them. Um, you know, the clinical exam, the vision, and, and even the ultrasound. Um, so, um, so then after that, we will uh, fine tune our treatment according to uh, the, the response to the treatment we have already done. Thank you, Dr. Abbot. Thank you very much. Um, does anyone have any other comment or a general? Uh, well, I entirely uh, agree with Dr. Abbot in his points. Endophthalmitis and acute issues and if stating, you cannot wait to make sure when as you are clinically diagnosed, there is suspicious even though it's not definite, you have to take your fetal stab injection. I think so the PCR issues, it could help a lot in uh, uh, refractory or resistant cases where can identify the organism, especially when the culture is negative and not responding well. And if and so I will not wait until get this result. I may I will get immediately for vitrectomy and clear up the vitreous. Okay. Uh... Any other if you comment? allow me, me Dr. Uh, Hazazi, uh, thank you for the, the presentation and the organization. And uh, uh, I, I'm thinking of um, uh, vitrectomy whenever it's become less than counting finger. And as you know, most of the studies came for endophthalmitis is the oldest study because it's a rare disease. It's very difficult to have a, a, a big number of cases to be able to analyze it. So. Uh, light perception as a standard to go in for vitrectomy, I think it's it's an uh, old regimen. You have to be uh, fast acting, and I will go for vitrectomy if the visual acuity is less than counting finger as a standard. But we should uh, we should believe that the treatment for, in my point of view, is the antibiotic intravitreal injection rather than vitrectomy. Vitrectomy, you are debulking the eye from the inflammatory from the organism, but which may make the difference is the intravitreal injections. And as Dr. Aboud and Dr. Hassan al said, whenever you, you inject the antibiotic, first of all, you have to tap and do the vitreous tap. If you are not going to do the vitrectomy, diagnostic vitrectomy, you can just do the vitreous tap, send it for analysis, and at the same time, you can inject the intravitreal injection and supervise the patient for one day or two days follow-up to make sure that uh, he doesn't need any other uh, further intervention. Uh, most of the time, uh, I believe in culture and sensitivity more than the PCR, even though uh, the study was very interesting to show the PCR. I believe PCR is good for screening, but to be honest, I would change my antibiotic uh, building on culture more if I don't have a uh, useful culture result. I would use PCR to change my decision for choosing an uh, uh, antibiotic. But as you know, we use a proud spectrum, two types of antibiotic, vancomycin and some of the uh, sphalosporin and uh, uh, I believe injecting some dexamethasone could help you uh, uh, in two ways. If it was an uh, uh, inflammatory response, intraocular inflammation because of the uh, uh, immunological or anti VGF, it will help you to calm the inflammation. If it was endophthalmitis, since you already give the antibiotic, this is going to calm the, the inflammation a little bit. And as you know, inflammation can cause retinal necrosis and end up with a very severe uh, BVR. This is in my point of view. Uh, thank you. Yeah, th thank you, both of us. Uh, I will uh, just only one comment. Probably 
um, be, you know, physician or in general, you know, the treating physician won't go into PCR unless they, they are really stuck with the available, uh, let's say, negative uh, culture and stain to yield any of the organism. And this is why he is just trying to, uh, in a very aggressive disease, to find any other alternative way to find out the diagnosis. Uh, we will uh, touch all of these aspects regarding the, uh, the vitrectomy and the uh, medical treatment in the coming uh, uh, presentation. Uh, Dr. Akili will be introducing this second speaker. Uh, thank you, everybody. Uh, and we are getting a lot of questions. I just want to remind everyone that we're going to answer those probably at the end to keep you uh, hooked. <laughs> so, um, so our next speaker will be uh, uh, Dr. Adil Shamrani. Uh, Dr. Adil Shamrani is a, is a surgical retina fellow at uh, Kekish, the first year. Uh, and he's going to talk about the emergency management of endothermites. Abdelaziz. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, now I'm going to uh, talk about the emergency management of endothermitis. Uh, as you all know, uh, that the early recognition and timely intervention are important in cases of endothermitis. And the emergency management is uh, tab and inject as soon as possible. And we usually do the vitreous tab rather than the AC tab because it yields uh, more culture positivity. And according to Foster et al, uh, aqueous aspirates uh, never positive in the face of negative vitreous culture. So prior to the vitreous sample, we need to do a thorough examination of the eye uh, to establish the diagnosis. We do a B-scan if the media precludes an adequate view of the posterior segment as well as a, as a baseline for the follow-ups. We need also to evaluate for the presence of retinal choroidal detachment because it might uh, change our surgical planning or maybe it might guide us during tab and inject to uh, avoid uh, more trauma to the uh, already traumatized eye. Uh, how to collect the sample? We have many ways. One of them is the tab and inject with needle aspirate. Uh, we can do office biopsy with portable vitrector, and we can do a surgical vitrectomy in the operating theater. So what to inject? We usually inject two antibiotics to cover both gram-positive and gram-negative bacteria, such as the vancomycin, one milligram per 0.20 ml, uh, with ciftazidim, uh, two milligram per 0.20 ml, with or without dexamethasone, 400 microgram per 0.20 ml, and should be avoided fungal infection is suspected, such as in cases of uh, uh, post-traumatic endothermitis. So what if the antibiotic preparation are not available? One of the options that has been described in the literature is to use the trade name Vigamox, or uh, moxifloxacin um, eye drops uh, to be injected intravitreally. And the dose that has been described in the literature is 500 microgram per 0.20 ml. And it shown be, to be effective against uh, bacterial endophthalmitis. And as you know, 1% uh, of a solution is 10 milligram per 1 ml. And the uh, Vigamox, it comes in 0.5%, uh, which is 5 milligram per one ml, or in other words, it is uh, 5,000 microgram per one ml. And if we take 0.1 ml to be injected in the eye, it will be the same concentration that has been described in the uh, reports of the literature. In other words, you can directly take the, um, the um, uh, medication from the Vigamox bottle injected directly to the eye without any special preparation. And after that, you can send the patient to a higher center for further management. So what after tab and inject, we usually send the capped syringe uh, immediately to micropyology lab for blood agar for Europe and neurobic bacteria, chocolate agar for Neisseria and homophilus, the cyborod agar for fungi, thioglycolate broth for the aneurobes, and two to four slides for gram stain, gims stain, with or without GMS or calc floor white stains. So the question is how to prepare uh, the intravitreal medications. In some institutes, we are lucky to be surrounded by pharmacists, but in others, uh, the ophthalmologist himself might be the one who is doing the, uh, or preparing the medication. So it is uh, important for us to know how to prepare these uh, medications. For vancomycin, we need uh, a vial of vancomycin 500 milligram used for injection. And we need also a bottle of normal saline uh, 10 ml or 
uh, we can use also distilled water preservative free. So steps to make the, uh, the medication. First, we aseptically withdraw 10 ml of the normal saline and we add it to the vial of the vancomycin. So we get a concentration of 50 milligram per ml, which is the same concentration that we use for fortified uh, antibiotics. We shake the vial gently to mix. After that, from this vial, we will draw one ml and we uh, inject it into a sterile 10 ml vial. After that, we add a uh, normal cell and 4 ml to that uh, vial. So we get a concentration now of 10 milligram per ml. So now we finish the preparation of the medication. Now the easiest step is to withdraw 2 ml, 0.2 ml of the vancomycin solution to a tubercular syringe. We change the needle to 30 gauge needle. Then we expel the excess amount, which is 0.1 ml. So we get a ready amount 0.1 ml of the solution uh, to be injected uh, into the eye. At the end of presentation, I'll give you a barcode to uh, scan for a video and the way of uh, medication preparation. And the expiration date of the prepared medication is 24 hours. Regarding ciftazidine, we need uh, a vial of ciftazidine uh, injection powder, one gram or 1,000 milligram. And we also need uh, 8 ml of normal saline, and we also need 9.4 ml of distilled water. So first, we aseptically add uh, 9.4 ml of distilled water to the vial of the ciftazidine. So we get a concentration of 100 uh, milligram per, point to, uh, per one ml. We shake the vial uh, to mix. Then we withdraw two ml of that uh, vial and we add it to another vial, sterile vial of 10 ml. Then we add to that vial 8 ml of the normal saline and we shake it. So we get now a 20 milligram per one ml concentration. So now we finished preparing the medication. And now, uh, like the vancomycin, we withdraw a 0.2 or 0.3 ml to a tuberculin syringe. We change the needle to 30 gauge needle. We expel the excess, which is 0.2 ml, and uh, it is ready to be injected into the eye. And the expiration date is 24 hours after the preparation. And regarding the dexamethasone, it is the easiest because no need for special preparation. We just need a vial of dexamethasone phosphate, four milligram per one ml, and we aseptically withdraw uh, 0.3 ml and uh, to a tuberculin syringe. Then we change the needle to 30 gauge needle and we take 0.1 ml of uh, 400 microgram per 0.1 ml of dexamethasone to be ready to inject it into the eye. So now let's move to the technique of tab and inject. Before we start um, our, for the ophthalmologist, before he start, uh, everything needs to get ready. So we need the medication uh, that will be ejected inside the eye, as well as the 2% lidocaine for the anesthesia. We also need bovidone iodine, both 5% to the ocular surface and 10% to the surrounding area. We need also a needle to aspirate the medication. For example, this is an 18 gauge needle uh, coded in pink. We need the caliber. We need uh, one of these uh, needles we have in the gray. This is a 27 gauge needle, or we can use, which is coded in orange. This is a 25 gauge needle. We also need a three ml um, syringe for the tab. We need uh, three tuberculin syringes, two for the uh, injection of the antibiotic. And the third one is to inject the subconjunctival uh, lidocaine. We need also a speculum. We need a topical anesthetic. We also might need the forceps to uh, stabilize the iron and elevate the conjunctiva. We might also need the uh, wixel or Q-tipped applicator uh, to dry the surface or to stabilize the eye uh, or by four by four um, to dry the surface. So uh, let's now move to the uh, video. Uh, you can see the video. Yes, it just started. Uh, can you play it? 
Okay. Uh, first, you um, uh, clean the surrounding area with bovidone iodine, uh, the surrounding skin, the eyelashes, the warming gland orifices, and you also apply 5% bovidone iodine to the cul-de-sac to clear the ocular surface. Then you apply um, a speculum to start the procedure. This is a, a recent case, uh, MK-related uh, endophthalmitis that have been injected uh, then uh, one week ago. First, we... Uh, this is a painful procedure and subconjunctival lidocaine is advised. And we did it here temporarily. Uh, this patient has a superior uh, filtering blip extended to the nasal uh, uh, ocular surface. That's why we put it in the temporal area. Uh, some uh, retina specialists also prefer to do the tap and inject inferior temporal. So then we wait for the lidocaine to work. We wait two to four minutes or maybe five minutes for the lidocaine to work as it's a painful procedure. We put the caliber to three and a half in pseudophicic eyes, four millimeter in thickic eyes. We mark the area. Uh, this step is an extra step here. The uh, ophthalmologist is displacing the conjunctiva to decrease the uh, leakage risk, it's uh, optional. And then he go, uh, is going tangential to the ocular surface to make a tunnel. Then he changed the angle and we always aim towards the optic nerve of the mid vitreous cavity. Then we start to tap uh, the vitreous. Sometimes uh, there is a nice trick because uh, if you try to uh, withdraw the vitreous, there is nothing uh, that comes. You can uh, retract the needle a little bit to get into a liquefied vitreous and we get, you get a sample. But in some cases, it might be difficult to get a vitreous sample. This is a 25 gauge needle. And here uh, we couldn't get any um, um, vitreous sample. So the other option is to do an AC tab. Here, the plunger must be uh, removed. So with counter pressure, we tab the anterior chamber. But uh, as we have said, the culture positivity with uh, vitreous is higher compared to the AC tabs. Then after getting the uh, sample, we cap it. Then we send it to a microbiology lab for uh, analysis. After that, we inject the antibiotics work with or without the dexamethasone at, um, at the same distance. It's very important to check the vision because sometimes the high IP might uh, decrease the optic nerve perfusion. This patient had hand motion vision before the uh, procedure. Then we apply the bovidone iodine at the um, ocular surface at the end of the procedure. Uh, you can get the uh, video by scanning this uh, barcode. And uh, thank you so much. Thank you very much, Abdez. It's very practical and very nicely prepared presentation. Uh, please keep the, 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 uh, this uh, page on so people can, can scan it. Um, uh, so uh, uh, I just want to ask a practical question uh, to Dr. Saad al uh, In terms of uh, the, how, you, how you typically do your, your injection, um, do you uh, use the same, uh, uh, the same uh, 25 gauge uh, needle for, for aspirating and then using the same one for injection? Uh, what, what, what's your uh, personal preference in, in this kind of uh, procedure, Dr. Saad? Uh, thank you, Dr. Adam, for Dr. Abdelaziz Charan for this nice presentation. Uh, usually, I do with the 25 gauge needle, and as he mentioned clearly and uh, nicely, uh, just to move it inside the vitreous. And if you don't have any uh, fluid coming, just move the, the needle inside to make it uh, in a liquefied space. And most of the time, we get uh, samples. But I want to pay attention in vitrectomized eye, don't use 25 gauge needle, use 30 gauge needle instead. Because uh, if you use 25, the eye will collapse suddenly. You may have supracolloidal hemorrhage or, or uh, complication rather than uh, uh, helping the patient. So just pay attention, better to my eye, just 30 gauge needle is enough and you will have uh, quickly fluid coming. But for non vitreous eye, 25 gauge needle is an uh, is, uh, option. If it didn't come, use 23 gauge needle or you can use the cutter. 
Thank you very much. So, um, a question, Dr. Hassan Zibi. In terms of uh, performing such procedure, we know that this is uh, typically a very uh, uh, traumatic uh, situation for both uh, the, the ophthalmologist and, and, the, um, and, and the patient himself when they typically present to your clinic within the psoriasis. Maybe it's because of procedure that was done in the same institution or somewhere else. Uh, so, uh, are you uh, uh, someone that, that advised to do this in, in the OR, uh, um, add more anesthesia, or is it something that you would uh, typically advise to do in, a, in any place that, that, uh, that you have a chair and, and a patient that can lay down in, in his back and then do it? How do you look uh, to a situation? Like As um, a procedure is uh, mandatory and essential in these cases, I will not hesitate if I have a irritable patient, difficult patients, uh, sometimes the patient cannot really fix his, you know, head and, uh, you know, uh, uh, letting you to do the procedure in the right way. So it is really you have to evaluate your patient brief before uh, getting it in the minor uh, OR to get the tab or in the office. You know, using some uh, conjunctival, you know, uh, uh, anesthesia, it's helpful in a lot of patients. Try to start with that to give the patient some painkiller before we starting on and uh, uh, talk with him about the procedure itself. This is helpful a lot because some patients might be not accepting the procedure easily while the, he's in pain and especially in one eyed patient. So I will not hesitate to take the patient to the OR until uh, uh, after uh, light anesthesia. Uh, this is what I usually uh, do with my patient, but I don't have hesitant to take my patient to the OR if he's not able to tolerate the procedure in the office. The, I would like to thank Dr. Abdul Aziz for his really nice illustrated uh, video, showed all the steps uh, in, the, in, a, in a way. Uh, there is sometimes that, because I noticed that might be you are changing the needles a lot getting in. There is another you know, uh, identical procedure that you can use one needles. Uh, it's a good to have 25 gauge short needle, which is safe, that what's safer you do is not, especially with your pre op uh, uh, pre injections, uh, ultrasound that show you that, that there is no retinal detachment. So, uh, I'm using some time another needle, short needles, a little bit longer with clumping it uh, and starting to take my tap and even to inject through that uh, needle with clumping. This is need another assistant to be at besides you, but it seems that decrease the uh, multiple penetrations of the blue while you're adding the tap. But otherwise, I'll do the same. Uh, 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 procedure as Dr. Abdelaziz did. Thank you, Dr. Hassan, for this practical uh, advice. Uh, a question to uh, Dr. Ahmed Aboud in regards to uh, dexamethasone. Uh, this is always something that comes in, in, uh, in discussions. Uh, when do you uh, prefer using it? Um, yeah, well, uh, all uh, cases of uh, acute postoperative endophthalmitis, which uh, in the vast majority, in the overwhelming majority of the cases, is bacterial, um, then um, I, I really use dexamethasone on all these cases. Um, and uh, the only time I would hesitate is. Uh, in the chronic endophthalmitis, uh, if I have suspicion of fungus being uh, involved or I don't know what's the organism in the eye, then definitely uh, I would hold. Uh, antibiotics is the, after all, is, uh, are the most important agents. Um, but um, in the vast majority of cases being the acute one, I, I go for the dexamethasone. Um, with the concentration that was mentioned already and the, the way Abdelaziz mentioned it beautifully. Um, I, will, I will add one thing, um, is that when you aspirate in the vitreous, uh, one comment, if I might, um, when you aspirate the, uh, the vitreous and you feel like you're not getting anything, um, and indeed, uh, you know, the vitreous might be difficult for you to get fluid um, uh, uh, like you do in the anterior chamber or in the trachomized eye, but still don't let the plunger, uh, don't leave the plunger. When you come out, just, I mean, keep your, your pull on the plunger and so that when you come out, you know, pull out because the, the needle might have a sample um, that then you get in the syringe. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, so, and it can be really precious and, uh, and yield the organism. 
Uh, thank you very much. Uh, just just a, a final question, Dr. Abdullah Al Qahtani, with regards to antibiotics. Uh, do you do you have any other preference, or or you you do? Uh, uh, I mean, other thank than vancocepta. Thank you, Dr. Adil and Dr. Abdulaziz. Very well uh, illustrated the antibiotics. It's the same protocol that Abdulaziz uh, show. Uh, the only things it uh, may be different. I don't use frequently the 25 gauge, even though I know it's wider, easier to withdraw the, the uh, vitreous. But uh, I believe uh, uh, in most of the time with even 30 gauge or 26, 27, you can, you can uh, withdraw strongly some, some amount. Uh, uh, some, some of the idea is to use the betadine intravitreally comparing to uh, uh, antibiotic. And there is a Chinese study showing that uh, you can do it intravitreally uh, with a special concentration. It's not very popular. We don't have a lot of information on that, but actually it's, it's uh, an idea out of the box, definitely. Some people use even whenever they do the vitrectomy, they put some betadine inside the bottle of the fluid. So whenever you are sucking through the vitrectomy, you are already irrigation uh, going on and that wash every remnant of the, of the cavity of the eye. Yes, uh, Adil, may I? I yeah, go ahead, uh, Regarding also the technique, um, uh, I think it's also important to mention the, uh, the, uh, the size of the syringe, which will give you higher vacuum. If, uh, uh, you know, not all the uh, places that they will have um, special uh, syringes, uh, let's say the, the one CC is not uh, at all, um, adequate to uh, build a, a good vacuum to aspirate and a very uh, uh, dirty, dirty uh, vitreous. So probably I always prefer to use the, the three CC, uh, but keep in mind if you are the one, um, uh, or if you have assistant who is actually uh, doing the, the vacuum, not to aspirate half of the vitreous because uh, the, uh, the marks are really, uh, uh, if someone is not, uh, you know, familiar with the uh, dashes or the marks in the vitreous, and this had happened actually happened to me, with the assistant almost uh, aspirated half of the vitreous vigorously. So uh, um, I asked him stop and let's just uh, inject some of the, uh, uh, let's say, uh, basis to fill the group again. I may add small small comments. Go ahead, uh, uh, Doctor uh, Abdelaziz. Really. Uh, give us the how to prepare the intravitreal antibiotic, which is an important. Not all the ophthalmology departments having pharmacists that help them. And uh, doing the vitreous tap is essential as a general procedures. Uh, we noticed most of the in the last you know, few years that the ophthalmologist sending the patient and taking two to three days because he couldn't able to prepare this antibiotic which is an essential to be in their pocket. When they have doing their cataract cases, you have to expect some day, second day that you have the cases, uh, the case of endothermitis. So really I'm, I'm advised strongly to keep these preparations always and usual in the department. So at the time that you suspect any case immediately rather than to send the patient long uh, journey to travel to hospital can do the fetal seven injection. Awesome, and we, and we can we can also distribute this uh, this video to to everyone who is interested as well. I yeah, I'm already is... asked the King Khalid I specialist in pharmacy to prepare a video, but unfortunately, it wasn't really uh, done on times. But I'm sure that by Sunday it will be ready by Sunday and ready in, in, in our hands. So then we then can be distributed to all the authorities that need it. If you uh, allow me, Dr. Adel, for uh, it's a wonderful comment from Dr. Hassan and Dr. Hazazi, actually. Um, volume is very important to create the negative pressure. So if you use three, three ml, you are creating a zero, you are pulling the blinger and creating a special volume, which is related to the syringe itself. And you are losing this negative pressure with time. If you keep sucking, you are losing the negative pressure that you applied. So you have to pull again. In this way, as much volume you have, and you are using the big, bigger syringe, as much negative pressure that you apply and as much uh, vitreous you can get. Why I prefer the small needle? Because small needle doesn't apply a lot of 
uh, polling on the retina, which is already uh, uh, necrotized in some cases. Uh, because as much the needle is small, as much the negative pressure that you are apply, creating a liquefying force on at the tip of the needle that pull more, uh, 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 some small sample. Second comment of Dr. Hassan Azazi, I know in some countries, they choose a hospital in every city and just make a reference for any endophthalmitis case to prepare the injection. And I, I, I maybe propose keeping this uh, video on the website of the Saudi, uh, Saudi Society for Ophthalmology and choosing, for example, a referral hospital like an eye hospital in Jeddah and Kekish in, in Riyadh or an eye hospital, specialized eye hospital in Dahran to make one guy responsible on call, like how to prepare those injection, or if you need injection, you can just ask him to prepare it and make it second day for any private or governmental hospital. I think this is, is extremely rare to be used, but at least we have this uh, uh, plan whenever uh, needed, there is someone can help. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Dr. Abdullah, for these uh, nice comments. Uh, I think we're uh, uh, we're getting a little bit uh, uh, late uh, on our uh, time, so I'm going to move to the next presentation. Uh, our next uh, speaker will be uh, Dr. Abdullah Bahlal. He's a second year fellow uh, uh, in uh, VR division at Kekish, and he will be talking about surgical management of endothermites. Dr. Abdullah. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullah. Good evening, everybody. Uh, it's really my pleasure to be among you today, among uh, an experienced retina surgeons and uh, among a wonderful audience. Uh, I hope um, my presentation and my colleagues' presentations uh, will will uh, will give benefit actually to those who attended, and uh, um, the discussion can also help us fellows and my my colleagues who did not have the uh, chance to present today, also to get some benefit from our senior um, uh, consultants. Um, so uh, my topic today is about surgical management of endophthalmitis. And uh, surgical management of endophthalmitis is actually um, a, a very subspecialized procedure. Uh, most of the time when we say surgical management of endophthalmitis, we talk about vitrectomy. However, other uh, surgical techniques are used in management of endothermitis, and we'll talk about them later. Um, uh, vitrectomy is actually a huge advent in retina uh, field, uh, especially in, the, in, the, in endothermitis, uh, where medical management was actually the standard of care before uh, vitrectomy was used uh, in, the, in the management, which actually improved the outcome of such uh, disease. Um, uh, so I will be presenting the surgical, um, wh why do we do vitrectomy, what is the rationale, and what, what are actually the indications, and what is the surgical technique of doing so. Um, most of the material uh, presented in this lecture are actually courtesy of Dr. Hassan Adibi and Dr. Adel Aguile, and I'd like to thank them for this. Um, so why vitrectomy? So actually, um, vitrectomy can help us get a proper amount of sample material for microbiological assessment. As you know, uh, tab and inject procedure not always give you a, a proper sample that will allow for identification of the microorganism. It has also the same principle that uh, we that is generally uh, utilized in general surgery and other forms of, of surgery, which is the incision and drainage. So uh, in general surgery, any abscess that collects into a cavity is usually drained as, as a, a main principle of management. And after the drainage, usually there is a resolution or improvement of such a uh, problem or illness. In endothermitis, we do vitrectomy as uh, uh, following the same principle. It also help uh, in the uh, resolution and removal of toxins from the eye, which actually can be very hurtful to, to a sensitive tissue like the retina and the optic nerve. Uh, there is usually faster clearance of media obesity and faster removal of bacteria from posterior segment. And this allows for better um, uh, diffusion of antibiotic inside the ocular cavity. Uh, indications usually uh, in the acute post-operative endothermitis after cataract surgery and for other forms of endothermitis. Uh, we cannot talk about uh, post-cataract endothermitis without talking about endothermitis vitrectomy study, which is actually a very prominent study in the 90s that uh, published very useful data 
uh, reducing actually the field of controversy in, uh, in, in endothelmitis. Uh, there was a huge controversy whether to do vitrectomy. And if you want to do vitrectomy, what is the proper time or what is the proper indication for vitrectomy and endothelmitis? So uh, this study aimed at studying the efficacy of vitrectomy with intraocular antibiotics versus vitreous tab and intraocular antibiotics. Uh, 420 patients were enrolled in the study and all of them had uh, acute post-cataract endothelmitis that presented in the first few weeks, first six weeks post-surgery. And uh, there was a second randomization uh, to patients whether they received an intravenous antibiotic or not. So uh, results actually uh, came out to be uh, 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 fruitful and uh, patients with visual acuity uh, with hand motion or better had no difference whether you did vitrectomy or tab and inject. So the, the primary uh, determinant of the value of vitrectomy was actually the initial visual acuity. Uh, light perception uh, patients actually improved better with, with the, when vitrectomy was done with intravitreal antibiotics. Um, then later on, a retrospective subgroup analysis was done for diabetic patients, comparing them to non-diabetic patients. And this uh, gave an idea that uh, probably vitrectomy can be done to diabetic patients, regardless of their initial vision. However, this was not statistically significant result. Uh, regarding intravenous antibiotics, actually, it did not affect the outcome. However, we need to know that the uh, type of antibiotic that, that was used uh, in the EVS study was not actually covering a broad spectrum. Uh, so we cannot really make a, a, a strong conclusion about using intravenous antibiotics and uh, endothermitis. Uh, so uh, the general recommendation and guidelines in these patients, actually, if you have a, a diabetic patient, then regardless of vision, early vitrectomy is preferred. Uh, if you have a patient without diabetes and his vision is light perception, then uh, probably initial vitrectomy is needed. However, we need to make a very strong comment here that if vitrectomy uh, is going to delay the uh, injection of antibiotics, uh, for example, for preparation of the patient or MBO time is not uh, appropriate, then you need to uh, do the tab and inject procedure as soon as possible and do not delay because you are preparing for vitrectomy. So um, moving to post-traumatic endothermitis, this is a little bit more complicated and more challenging. Why? Because actually these eyes are uh, possibly having other secondary uh, effects or other secondary complications from trauma, like you might have secondary retinal detachment, you might have a large non-sealing uh, non wound that, that is very difficult to seal and close. You might have a ruptured lens, or you have, uh, for example, avulsion of the optic nerve that you discover intraoperatively. So this is actually uh, uh, usually makes your surgery and your intervention more uh, complicated. Uh, th these eyes also have uh, polymicrobial uh, my, um, uh, uh, organisms. So, so you might have multiple organisms proliferating inside the eye and then uh, the detection and treatment of such organisms is a little bit more complex. Uh, organisms from uh, trauma actually uh, most prominently are bacillus, and then uh, bacillus is very destructive inside the eye. Uh, so uh, regardless of your treatment, if you don't do the treatment in on time, actually uh, th uh, these eyes might have very poor prognosis. So uh, in general, uh, as a general recommendation, post-traumatic endothermitis require earlier vitrectomy. Same thing goes for blib-related endothermitis. Most of the time, the organism is Streptococcus species. This is different if you have an early or late onset blib-related endothermitis. However, in general, it's a Streptococcus uh, species in 60% of cases. Uh, the visual outcome is very poor uh, in these eyes. So uh, consider early vitrectomy and be very cautious if you want to extrapolate results of, from AVS study to eyes uh, that actually do not go into the inclusion or exclusion criteria of EVS study, like patients with blib-related endothermitis. So um, what is the procedure if you are doing uh, surgical management for endothermitis? So talking about anesthesia first, uh, these eyes tend to be very inflamed and very painful. So general anesthesia is very preferred. Um, in, if, you, if you give biribulbar anesthesia or 
uh, subtenon anesthesia, this is not usually adequate uh, to control the pain uh, during the surgery. You might use local anesthesia if you are planning very short procedure or, or the patient is not fit for general anesthesia. However, you need to know that the um, uh, the, the eye might not have an adequate anesthesia, you might, and you might need to administer additional anesthesia during the surgery. So insertion, insertion of infusion is usually done 3.5 millimeter from the limbus. It's usually done inferotemporally as we do in other uh, vitrectomies. Uh, you, do not, you should not open uh, the infusion before identifying that it's inside the vitreous cavity. And sometimes because you might have an associated choroidal detachment or thickening of the ocular wall, uh, you might need to use a, a longer uh, cannula uh, for infusion. Uh, it's, it might be uh, wise to revise your uh, wound, whether it was a corneal wound, corneoscleral laceration. Do not depend on the primary repair if the primary repair was done initially. Uh, it, the, the, your wound might be still leaking and it might need an, uh, additional bites for complete closure. Vitrectomy must be done in closed chamber. So if you do not have proper closure of the wound, you might aggravate the, the situation with supracoroidal hemorrhage and uh, intraoperative hypotony. So um, uh, the surgical technique for removal of hypobion or for AC washout to allow for uh, proper visualization of the posterior segment, we have a couple of videos prepared by Dr. Adel Aguili uh, uh, nicely demonstrating the removal of the hypobion and the fibrinous material from the anterior chamber uh, using Simco cannula. This is one way to do it. Uh, another way is to, is to uh, fill, with, uh, fill the anterior chamber with uh, viscoelastic material and then um, uh, mobilize the hypobion or the fibrinous uh, organized membrane with uh, long forceps or the regular capsulorexis forceps can do the job. If you might not have this uh, subspecialized long um, uh, micro forceps. Um, if there is a, a bleeder that occurs with mobilization of these uh, fibrinous membranes or this hypobion, uh, then you might be able to increase the pressure inside the anterior chamber by in injecting additional uh, OVD solution or OVD material. Uh, so uh, we see that uh, the, the aim of removing this uh, inflammatory material from the AC is to debulk the material as we uh, aim uh, to achieve in the vitreous cavity also, uh, but also to, to clear the view for us to, con to, con to continue the vitrectomy procedure uh, safely with uh, proper visualization. So this is also another video. It's showing the uh, revision and the exploration of the previous uh, wound. Uh, and then placement of the trockers. You can see that we have a very well uh, dilated pupil with proper visualization of the uh, trocker cannulas. And then the anterior chamber was uh, entered. And then using uh, along uh, micro forceps, the uh, organized fibrinous membrane and hypobion is being removed from the anterior chamber. So um, after clearing the anterior chamber, then uh, you might want to take an undiluted vitreous sample. This is achieved by uh, inserting the infusion cannula, but not turning the infusion on. Uh, you want to connect the vitrector uh, to a 10 cc syringe, and then have your assistant, who is supposed to be experienced in this uh, procedure, to aspirate uh, an amount of 0.2 to 0.3 cc uh, and uh, tell you uh, immediately after the complete aspiration of this amount, uh, so you can stop cutting and then turn on the infusion after you, re you remove your uh, vitrector from the inside the eye. Um, this is uh, supposed to be done very carefully. Uh, it's very crucial step. Uh, you want to get an undiluted vitreous sample. However, you don't want hypotony to occur during this step, which will result into collapse of the eye and possibly an injury of the lens or injury of the retina. So you see Dr. Hassan uh, is uh, doing a, a dry uh, vitrectomy now before turning on the fusion. So very uh, clear visualization of the tip of the cutter. Uh, it is placed in the anterior 
uh, or mid vitreous um, area. And then after getting the appropriate amount or the appropriate volume for microbiological assessment, then you can turn on the infusion, uh, reconnect your, the, your uh, vitrector uh, aspiration line to the machine, and then uh, proceed with doing the vitrectomy. Uh, the uh, vitreous sample should be sent uh, immediately to microbiology for assessment. Sometimes you might not have a microbiology unit available and ready for uh, receiving this instrument uh, for um, uh, receiving this uh, sample for assessment. So you might have to do this yourself inside the operating theater or your assistant or the nursing staff. So this specimen should be distributed over uh, 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 two glass slides for gram and ginza stains and then uh, the blood agar and chocolate agar. Um, then after you finish collecting the sample, uh, vitrectomy should be done anteriorly and then you move uh, backward. Uh, this is a case of uh, a chronic uh, post-operative endothelmitis, but actually it shows the principle that we are talking about. So you, you start your vitrectomy behind uh, the intraocular lens or behind the lens to clear the view and clean the anterior uh, vitreous or the anterior hyaloid. Um, this should be done under, under direct visualization. If there is no proper view, you should not be uh, doing uh, vitrectomy uh, as it might hand, uh, cause harmful effect to structures that you do not properly uh, visualize. Um, at, at this step, infusion was seen already and it was um, uh, verified to be in the vitreous cavity. Uh, cutting is done behind the intraocular lens to remove the infected uh, lens capsule and to remove the uh, capsular black. Um, moving forward, so, uh, and then in this uh, video, we will see how posterior vitrectomy should be, should be done. Um, so the aim of posterior vitrectomy is to de debulk the vitreous as much and as safe as possible, you need to debulk the, 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 the posterior um, uh, bus or the posterior uh, infected vitreous as much as, as possible. As we said, we want to do an incision and drainage a procedure and we want to remove as much uh, abscess as possible. Uh, this should be done in a very progressive and very slow fashion. You, you move into buckets one by one, you move into the vitreous layers one by one, you don't um, um, a cut uh, in an area that is, is, is possibly uh, has poor visualization and there is a, a suspicion of retinal detachment or choroidal detachment in that area. And for that reason, B-scan is, is very helpful before you start operating these cases to let you know where is the area of the choroidal elevation or choroidal detachment or if there is retinal detachment so you approach your vitrectomy very safely. Uh, aggressive vitreous space shaving is really uh, discouraged. Uh, and if you're gonna do it, you need to have a very high cut rate and low vacuum. So uh, in, in these eyes, the retina is very friable and inflamed and uh, doing high vacuum is uh, likely to cause uh, harmful effects. So uh, continuing with, with Dr. Hassan um, uh, operation and uh, surgical video, you can see that uh, debulking is done very nicely here. So the uh, inspection of the fundus is showing us an uh, infected uh, or actually uh, inflamed vitreous with uh, accumulation of uh, uh, inflammatory cells and debris. And you can see that there is a subretinal abscess that is not actually um, uh, not, not actually approached, just the vitreous uh, above it is, is cleaned. And then later on, the inspection, uh, the, the injection of antibiotic is likely to uh, help uh, resolve the, the infected area. So following the vitrectomy, um, sh careful shaving is done and then inspection and examination of the scleral depression 360 should be done uh, to localize any breaks or retinal detachment and treat them uh, if, if it was needed. And then later on, uh, we'll talk about the injection of antibiotics. So uh, BVD, so is that um, really necessary to induce or not? If it was present at the beginning, this, this makes your surgery easier. 
It will allow for complete vitrectomy and complete removal of the infected vitreous. Uh, sometimes in eyes with BVD, there is a premacular mound of inflammatory material. You might have to aspirate this uh, inflammatory uh, hypobian or inflammatory uh, bus collection uh, using the uh, cutter or using a uh, back flush or uh, an extrusion cannula. If the BVD is absent, you might uh, carefully uh, lift the posterior hyaloid if it was uh, needed. Uh, you might uh, need to use transfer loan to stain the posterior hyaloid to identify it and see if you have a BVD or not. However, forceful BVD is really discouraged. You might cause unnecessary retinal break in, in these sick eyes and sick retina, which might complicate the procedure even more. So each case should be judged uh, separately and uh, BVD induction is usually discouraged in the endophthalmitis vitrectomy. However, uh, if, if the retina looks healthy and the infection is very early, then BVD might uh, help uh, allow for complete vitrectomy. So Abdelaziz uh, demonstrated very, very nicely how to prepare intravitreal antibiotics. And you, call, you can go to the uh, KKish channel in YouTube to uh, view the video, uh, video at any time at your discretion. Uh, th this is the link and this is the shortcut link for uh, preparation and for injecting the antibiotics in the tab and the inject procedure. Injection of the intravitreal antibiotics is done after the closure of sclerotomies and the removal of the infusion cannula. We do not want our intravitreal antibiotics to be diluted. So you need to turn off your infusion, close the sclerotomy, and then inject them um, uh, in, a, in a closed uh, chamber. Uh, some uh, authors advocate using a half dose uh, if you are using a tamponade. So for example, if you use silicon oil or gas, you might want to use a half dose of antibiotics to reduce the risk of retinal uh, toxicity. What are the possible uh, complications that might result from uh, the surgery, actually hemorrhage? You might have intraoperative hyphema, uh, and we can increase the pressure in the anterior chamber by using OVD uh, material inside the uh, anterior chamber. If there is uh, bleeding from retinal blood vessel, uh, or there is subrachoidal uh, hemorrhage intraoperatively, then we might make sure that our vitrectomy is then closed chamber and we increase the intraocular uh, pressure. Um, so uh, retinal breaks are usually managed uh, with laser and appropriate use of tamponade. If they are anterior, then scleral buckles is an option. It might be used uh, as an adjunctive tool, um, especially in eyes with a trauma, if you have a traumatic endophthalmitis, trauma by, by itself is actually a risk factor for BVR detachment. Uh, if you have endophthalmitis, this is adding insult to injury and uh, scleral buckle might be a very nice protective um, uh, instrument or, or tool to be used in such eyes. However, you might want to know that uh, retinal breaks and retinal detachment and, and eyes with endophthalmitis carries very, very poor uh, prognosis. So to conclude, I would like to uh, mention to everybody uh, that an eye with uh, early presentation of endothelmitis um, requires a very uh, careful uh, approach and very prompt management. Uh, an eye that presents with early endothelmitis and hand motion vision, you can take this eye to 2030 vision with very good uh, outcome, or this eye might go into thysis bulbi depending on the initial management that is done by the uh, first uh, of thermologists to approach the case. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, Abdullah, very much. Uh, it was really an elegantly covered uh, surgical aspect of the uh, of the topic. Um, I would like just to raise a few uh, controversy in the management, um, actually medical versus uh, surgical. I will address the first question to uh, Dr. Aboud, if he's still with us. Dr. Aboud? Yes, sure, please. Yes, uh, Dr. Abud, if uh, I need your uh, feedback and input regarding uh, um, some they advocate for repeated injection versus early vitrectomy. Um, you said repeated injection versus uh, vitrectomy? Yes, versus, versus early vitrectomy. vitrectomy. Mm -hmm. Well, the, the decision of uh, uh, injection alone versus um, uh, vitrectomy as an initial uh, treatment, uh, you know, I mean, it was, uh, it was uh, covered, uh, it was mentioned, uh, you know, the, the EVS, and then I know it's an old study um, and so on. 
but um, it is good to know the the um, you know the criterion of the visual acuity, um, and maybe it's not answering. This is not answering your question, but it's a point I wanted to mention as, uh, to 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 everyone is that um, it is important when you test the vision for hand motion to make sure that you are not stuck to the face of the patient. It really has to be done to move your hand about two feet from the patient, 60 centimeters or so. Um, but if you just uh, stick to the face of the patient, it might be, you might label it hand motion when it is really light perception. So um, now, You've done your initial treatment. Um, most of us, if the patient doesn't respond, will probably uh, decide to, uh, to go and do a vitrectomy um, rather than uh, just do uh, another injection and see how the patient does. This is not wrong to decide to do a repeat injection, particularly if you don't have the facility of vitrectomy it is uh, within 36 to 48 hours, it is reasonable to consider if the patient didn't respond well to, to, to go for a second injection and then make arrangement to really refer the patient to a vitroretinal uh, service uh, the, who can handle it. Um, but if in the hospital there is a, ret a vitroretinal facility, I think most of us for non-responder will go for vitrectomy rather than repeat the injection. Thank you, Dr. Abboud. Uh, the other question is for Dr. Saad. Um, I, I know sometimes you're stuck with the very complicated cases that you, you know, and almost all the pathologists are uh, present. So if you have a patient with uh, uh, aggressive endothermitis uh, and there is um, choroidal detachment, there is no view to the uh, uh, let's see, the infusion cannula. So, uh, and we know that in most of those cases, you need to, uh, to use a temperament like silicon oil. Uh, at the same time, if there is a presence of retinal detachment, do you need to drain the choroid in the same setting, at least to uh, uh, have, uh, let's say, adequate filling of the silicon oil to avoid the retinal detachment uh, after the, uh, the choroidal uh, uh, let's say the uh, detachment went away. So there will be like a, an empty space to be filled with the silicon oil and this will jeopardize your retinal uh, surgery. I know it's a tough question, but Dr. Saad is always uh, our mentor and he's always able to answer any difficult questions. Thank you, Dr. Abdullah, and thank you uh, for Dr. Imad and all my colleagues. So your question has two points. Uh, number one is the approach. If there is choroidal detachment, and you cannot see the... the or the difficulty of uh, seeing the tip of the infusion. So instead of, I would use six millimeter infusion cannula and uh, instead of four, and I will be very anterior. Most of the traumatized eye or post cataract, I don't care about uh, the lens, so I'll, I'll be anterior. I will not go for 3.5 millimeter rather than one and a half or two millimeter even. And I will try to see the tip and I will be close to the lens and, until I see my infusion. If I couldn't, then I will do anterior chamber uh, maintainer and they work anteriorly with draining the choroid uh, and subacroidal uh, hemorrhage until the, the, the few and the choroid is uh, resolved. So this is to approach either from anterior and I drain or I uh, go through the burst plan anterior with lung infusion uh, and also I will drain with the trocar. So we all uh, advocate for draining the, the choroid. Yeah, because if there is, as you described, subacroidal hemorrhage or, uh, or uh, massive uh, choroidal effusion, uh, and there is a retinal detachment, uh, I will go on and put silicon for sure. Okay, okay, Dr. Hassan. Yes, please. And as yours. Yes. Uh, wow. uh, first <laughs> first wow. of all, as, as we receive thanks from Dr. Abdullah regarding sharing our, uh, you know, cases. I would like to thank Dr. Abboud because we had one uh, course in the Saudi ophthalmology in 2011 and we exchanged our you know, uh, presentations and the outline for surgical management of, uh, of uh, endophthalmitis being curated by him and we use it and he gave us the, you know, the permissions for that. 
it is tough questions. I think we have to know the aim of the vitrectomy uh, uh, endothelmitis. I think the first aim that to get you know adequate samples and to inject and to just only develop the vitreous. Uh, if the uh, ultrasound show that kissing corroded, this is very difficult, definitely. And then it, it's need to have some drainage. In case it's not kissing, and the ultrasound show me that I can get safely either with the uh, AC maintainer initially and starting to have debulking, it's okay. Uh, uh, otherwise, I will not go aggressive to uh, drain at immediate you know, uh, uh, sobrocoroidal uh, hemorrhage because it is not yet liquefied and it will be give difficulties. So my aim first to debulk the fetus and to give the injection. If the situations could do that, I will go with it. As mentioned by Dr. Saad, that it's already celiophic patient, it will be uh, easy that you don't have to be care about the lens. But in cases of trauma, this is mostly we face it all the time. So prepare yourself for tough cases, difficult, and needs to have to be patient when you are doing that. Starting with anterior chamber maintainers, do your drainage, and then you can get in the fetus uh, cavity. This is what I do usually in these cases. Amen. Thank you, Dr. Hassan. The last question is directed to Dr. Katani Abdullah. Um, what makes you decide to go for uh, in post-operative uh, or post cataract uh, endothermitis? What makes you decide to go and remove the the lens and capsule uh, complex, or just uh, go only for only a simple vitrectomy and preserve the I1? Well, this is very, uh, very nice question. And uh, uh, I add my voice to the voice of Dr. Hassan Adibi. Your aim for vitrectomy is to do uh, debulking of the inflammatory cells, uh, debulking of the uh, bacterial uh, uh, agent, and uh, giving a space for injection and more fluid be assessed to be able to spread this antibiotic all over the base of the uh, retina. Uh, I don't remove the IOL, honestly. Uh, I don't remember any single eye that I removed the IOL. Uh, I don't believe organism couldn't be treated with the uh, antibiotic intravitreally or vitrectomy. Whenever you remove the IOL, you can get an, a better prognosis. Uh, this is in, in my opinion, and uh, uh, I'm not really sure that IOL would be uh, very helpful. But can I add one point? Yes, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, nowadays we have the advantage of uh, you know, small gauge vitrectomy. And this is make, might be the vitrectomy for the cases is easier than the 20 gauge vitrectomy. So if you have the facilities initially and you're thinking that the fetus is more, you know, that. Uh, uh, involved, I think I will go with the uh, 27 gauge vitrectomy, debulking a little bit and giving the injection in cases that might be others can uh, uh, making their fetus tab and injections. So if you have the facilities, especially in diabetic patients, I will not hesitate to use small gauge, 27 gauge uh, vitrectomy and get my uh, procedure immediately rather than just only to go with it. Unless there is something is delaying to do that procedure. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Uh, I, I think we uh, we need to move to our uh, last presentation. This is the um, also uh, an interesting uh, part of, of this uh, session. Uh, Dr. Asma Zabi will be presenting uh, four uh, interesting cases, uh, and and I'll give her the mic now. Tell her, Dr. Asma. Uh, Assalamu alaikum wa Hello, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure actually to present uh, among you. Uh, I have uh, four uh, cases of endothelial mitis. Uh, the first two actually were presented to me during my on-call last month. The uh, last two uh, were handed to me by my thankfully by my mentor. So uh, I am Asma Zabi, a phone medical and neurobiotic uh, fellow uh, from King's Road University Medical City. So the first case is a 49 years old male. He's known case of diabetes hypertension and chronic kidney disease. He has a history of proliferative diabetic retinopathy and uh, diabetic macular edema. He was treated previously with paratinal photocoagulation, focal laser, and multiple intravitreal uh, anti vitreous injections. So he presented to the ER complaining of right eye pain, uh, redness, and the case of the gen. He has a history of intravitreal aflibertive injection for both eyes 
three days earlier. So during the presentation to the ER, the vision in the right eye was counting finger near face. It was the last documented 2100. IV was within normal, the conjunctival showed severe conjunctival injection with the conjunctival hemorrhage at the site of injection. Uh, cornea was edematous with dissonant fold. Uh, the, uh, the AC was deep with four blood cells and two millimeter hypopian. Uh, lens was clear and the fundus showed dense vitritis with hazy view to the fundus. This scan was done and it showed um, acidic thickening with uh, dense vitritis. So uh, the diagnosis was made to be a right post intravitreal injection in the same muscle. So uh, the uh, emergency management of the three staff with intravitreal. Uh, Injection of cyptopidine 2.25 mg in 0.1 ml, 1 comma is 1 mg in 0.1 ml, and dexamethasone 400 microgram in 0.1 ml. Patient was admitted and kept on bedmizerone of salmic drugs, moxifloxacin drugs, and oral moxifloxacin 400 mg per oral, per oral once daily. So, um, back to the again. Yes, uh, I think you, you might need to bring the mic a little bit closer for the sound to be a little bit clearer. Um, so, so just a, a question to our panelists with regards to, uh, to generally uh, post-injection uh, endophthalmitis. Any, any preference in terms of uh, performing vitrectomy or, or, uh, or just, um, just um, uh, dealing with it as, as uh, as the endophthalmic vitrectomy study suggests. I'll, I'll leave the question to Dr. Ahmed Abou. Uh, thank you, Adil and Asma. Um, uh, you know, in this particular case, as we are talking about uh, this, I completely agree that the, I would have also said that this is uh, endophthalmitis rather than, you know, that potentially an acute post-injection endophthalmitis that uh, needs to be managed accordingly rather than just a sterile ilea or a fever set related. Uh, so it was, uh, I completely agree with the diagnosis and the, um, I would have gone also with, the, with that kind of uh, visual acuity counting finger um, and, um, and uh, the appearance of the eye, I would have, I would go also with the tap and injection. Uh, if the eye I feel is, is severely, they do well really, I have done a few of those, uh, but uh, the, the, um, if the eye is uh, very severely uh, affected, I, uh, uh, I wouldn't hesitate to go for, uh, for vitrectomy. But in this particular case, I think it was really reasonable to go for tap and inject and uh, dexamethasone would have been also what I would have done. Uh, thank you very much. I, I think, uh, Dr. Asma, you can carry on because uh, we still have uh, a couple of... Uh, so the vitreous culture showed heavy growth of staph epidermidis. And 48-hour post-injection, the patient uh, was actually doing better. The vision was counting finger two feet. I view the, with the normal, the cornea was clearing, and the hypopene was decreasing, and was, there was a better view to the fundus. So the second case is for a 34 years old male who was medically free and he works as a carpenter. He presented to the ER with no pain, redness, and a blurring of vision of the right eye following a metal wire injury with no protective glasses since four days. He was treated previously as a case of traumatic iitis with prednisone of phthalmic and psychologic drugs with no improvement. So during the presentation to the ER, his vision was 2100 in the right eye. The IV was within normal, there was a conjunctival injection. Uh, actually, this picture, unfortunately, I didn't have a picture during the uh, time of presentation because it was during the meeting. This was one day of the treatment. And the cornea, we can see here that there, is, um, uh, there was a severe temporal uh, self sealed entry point, and sidle was negative. Uh, the AC was deep uh, with four blood cells and 1.5 millimeter high pocket. There was a crowding here of the iris, the pyrotemporal, at, at the same area of the uh, entry point. Uh, the lens showed a pectoral uh, intramenticular opacity at the back of the entry point, and we can see here the um, retroillumination. There was a dense bit writers with his view to the fundus, but there was a grossly flat retina. And this is a new scan showing the bit writers. So a diagnosis of right eye traumatic endothelitis with intramenticular abscess was made. So back to you, Dr. Adili. Uh, Dr. Adili, what would make you think that this is uh, 
this is uh, maybe lens related uh, inflammation uh, and treating it uh, as such rather than traumatic endophthalmitis. Well, uh, giving uh, uh, or getting back to the history of the patient having, uh, you know, as carpenter and might having trauma to what he's having, uh, I will not hesitate to consider this is endophthalmitis until proven otherwise. Uh, although there is, you know, abscess uh, that scenes. So uh, I will not go just only this is an, a case of uh, lens related. You know, it is this an, an adding factor to the endophthalmite itself. And you know that having lens material or, you know, uh, release lens material with the rupture of the capsule, it might aggravate pre-existing and sometimes it might the situations uh, uh, very terrible to make the decision. So I will not hesitate to uh, interfere uh, as a case of endothermas until proven otherwise. Excellent. So, uh, so uh, yeah, Dr. Asma, can we, can we move on to yes. what was done in this case? So uh, until the clearance of the patient for the surgery, the vitreous staff and intravitreal antibiotic of septicemia and localized was done. The patient was admitted, started with IV blood spectrum antibiotics and fortified antibiotics. And uh, vast plan of vitrectomy with mesectomy and re-injection of intravitreal antibiotic was done. The vitreous pain and culture showed vessel, but there was no growth. So 48 hours was up, the patient was doing well. Uh, the vision of content in their new space within the house was 2200. IOB with the normal, the cornea was clear and the AC was deep. Uh, and the sun desk showed a uh, flat retina. Um, yeah, okay. yeah, let's move um, to, this, to the third case. Okay. So the third case, uh, 56 year old female, she's medically free. She had a history of paraambulacral hernia repair in 2017. And she was, she was admitted to uh, the general hospital as a case of uh, intercutaneous fistula with a collection of conservative management by the surgical team. A phonology consultation was done during her uh, course of admission. So um, uh, during the examination, uh, the vision lip side was at least hand motion or you. The conjunctive was quite, quite or you. The cornea, cornea was clear and the issue was deep and quiet. The lens was clear and the fundus in the right eye was showed the clear vitreous clear, flat retina and no evidence of retinitis. But in the left eye, there was two plus lip vitritis with focal cornea retinitis involving the phobia. So this is the fundus photo. And this is the OCT showing um, the, this um, um, lesion uh, 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 originating from the uh, RPE and extending into the intraretinal layers would break through the island into the vitreous and you can see the shadowing into the car. So back to you, Dr. Adil. So Dr. Adil Gahtani, I, I, I want your opinion on this case. So uh, a patient like this who's otherwise medically free just had the surgery, uh, what would you think of, about in, in such a presentation? And why would you think? Uh, what, what, what's the rationale for a diagnosis like this? Well, to be honest, Dr. Adel, I missed some of the voice uh, during Dr. Azma's presentation. So, so uh, was, uh, if you can go back to the, to the, to the previous slide, Dr. Asma. Mm, sure. So, so, so a patient has uh, um, hernia surgery, and then she, was, uh, she had some complications and was uh, kept in the hospital, and then she presented with a decrease in vision and pain in both eyes. Okay. But there is no history of septicemia. Do we agree that there is no history of septicemia as it's uh, on? Uh, on uh... Uh, no, actually, yes, there was. Uh, during the hospital course, it was complicated with fungemia. Uh, candida, fungemia, I mean. secondary, yeah. Okay, so there, there is, central okay. Line, yeah. So there is uh, uh, candidemia. Actually, yeah. in most of the time when it's uh, around the macula, this is related yeah. mostly to the bloodstream. And there is a lot of study showing that why the metastasis came to the came to the macular area? Why the leukemic uh, uh, infiltration came mostly to the uh, macular area? Because this is more vascularized area. So whenever I see something in that place, I would really think of some sort of bleed bloodstream uh, infection, like candidemia, as you said. Well, since it has an a candidemia, uh, candidemia, I would I would think definitely of this uh, of this uh, organism. Mm -hmm. Yes, sure. So, uh, um, as you said, uh, Dr. Left Eye Indigenous Candidate of the uh, diagnosis was made. So, um, because the patient was um, 
uh, like bed um, in the ICU and her general condition was not uh, suitable for surgery. Notable uh, by the ID team, she was kept in uh, intra intravenous mycophungin and oral statin, and she underwent multiple intravitreal uh, injections, including amphotericin B and uh, voriconazole. Um, late, at the later stage, uh, she underwent the first line of vitrectomy with the reinjection of intravitreal voriconazole. So during the follow-up, her vision is 2400, IV with a normal cornea is clear, AC is even quiet. The fundus was showing clear medial, black retina, and macular scar. Okay. So, I, can, can I just ask a question? Yes. yes. You, you mentioned, Dr. Asma, that patient has been treated with intravitreal uh, yes. antifungal. Uh, does he have also, also intra-arterial? Intra or intravenous, yes. I mean systemic. Intravenous, yes. Yeah. Uh, I, I by would, the ID team, she was kept, yes. And make okay. a function intra intravenous. Yes. I would consider intravitreal intra as a secondary uh, uh, treatment management. Otherwise, mm -hmm. I, to me, in my opinion, the intra-arterial uh, or intravenous uh, is mostly important to me than intravitreal. Because as you said, this is came from the systemic and it should be treated systemically. Yes, sure. Awesome. So let's move to the last case, uh, Victoria. Okay. So the last case is for a 54 years old uh, East Asian male who is medically free. He presented to the ER with the right eye swelling and the progressive blurring of vision over the last five days. It was associated with fever and generalized body ache. There was no previous surgery, a trauma, or history of IV drug abuse. And there was no previous ocular history. So during the presentation, the vision in the right eye was hand motion, IOB of 42. Externally, he was having severe lid swelling with the proptosis, uh, global limitation of all the extraocular movement, severe conjunctival injection of chemosis, corneal edema with a fibrinous reaction and hypopianus 0.8 millimeter. There was no further view to the lens or to the posterior as well. The B-scan showed um, Acular thickening with infiltration of the ocular surface anteriorly and posteriorly. It is a retinal detachment, as you can see, and uh, severe arthritis. So, a diagnosis of right eye endogenous span of thalmitis was made. Uh, back to you, Dr. Uh, okay, thank you, Dr. I will uh, ask the question to Dr. Saad Dehmesh. So, in, in such a case, would you, would you, um, Consider um, consulting uh, oculoplasty. Uh, I mean, this eye is, is definitely, uh, uh, I mean, a, uh, has a, a, a terrible infection. It's span of, of, of thermitis. Uh, would you consider not just treating the, the vitreous, and, uh, I mean, the, the, the endothermitis alone, but treat the whole eye by, by maybe um, uh, evisceration or, 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 or an aggressive treatment, or, or how would you approach such case and why? Um, what was the vision? Just remind me. Hand motion? Hand motion. Yeah. So in hand motion vision with panophthalmitis, uh, because I saw most of the audience uh, uh, general ophthalmologists and resident, make sure this is not uh, orbital cellulitis secondary to intraocular tumor. Because such a presentation, a healthy person uh, who's not the elder, with no pre-existing medical issue, it can be as a presentation of intraocular tumor with orbital cell, secondary orbital cellulitis or uh, pseudo orbital cellulitis picture. But from the B scan, there is a choroid attachment and vitritis, and there is hypobion, and there is no visible calcification or uh, visible mass uh, that could, uh, I mean, single mass rather than choroid attachment. So it goes with their uh, preliminary diagnosis of endogenous endothermite. So I will treat, I will not uh, eviscerate or nucleate an eye with vision, even if it's having panophthalmitis. Uh, so just I will go with, the, as usual, vitrostab injection and treat with the uh, IV antibiotics in, in a tub of intravitreal antibiotics and see what's going on. Awesome. Okay. Uh, yeah. So, um... CT scan of the head and orbit was made, and after the plastic consultation was done, and it is actually based on the uh, uh, business of vision, uh, it was decided that the three staff with intravitreal antibiotics, such as the demon vancomycin, was done uh, admission in IV blood spectrum antibiotics. 
So uh, this is tab showed the growth of Klebsiella pneumonia, which was sensitive to this TBD, and a one medical consultation workup. There was leukocytosis with abnormal liver function test. The CT abdomen showed a high dense mass suggestive of liver abscess. So following this treatment, there was normalization of the liver function test and the end regression of the liver abscess. At a later stage, the patient underwent partial anabotrectomy and cataract extraction. So following the um, treatment, uh, this is following the uh, IV antibiotic and uh, intravitreal uh, injection. You can see the, the resolution of the um, uh, lead swelling and the uh, severe chemosis. Um, you can see here the resolution of the hypothalamus finger is like this, it's a little black and the cataract. So when we crossed up, the vision is uh, light perception. Uh, the IOB was uh, soft. Uh, the cornea was clear and the AC was deep with the trace. So, those ACK cans, you can see here that there is uh, a clear uh, vitreous uh, cavity with these cans. So, um, that's it for um, my presentation. Thank you. This a very nice collection of cases. Uh, and um, uh, I would like to thank you for. Uh, for uh, this um, nice uh, comments, uh, our, our panelists on these cases. I think we have some questions from our, uh, from our audience that we wanna address before we close our session because we actually have uh, passed our a lot of time. Uh, one of the question was, uh, was, that, was asked by, uh, uh, by uh, Dr. Nafil Merzoug about uh, those cases of uh, vitrectomized eyes uh, and uh, knowing that uh, typically uh, the antibiotic will will wash out quickly in those cases, uh, would you um, approach this in terms of uh, reinjecting uh, the eye again after a certain time, or or, or how, how would you approach such cases? Maybe this is a bit complex uh, question, but uh, I leave the question the answer to Dr. Hassan Al Dibi. Yes, as this eye is already tryptomized, and the ultrasound showed that no retinal detachment. I will not hesitate to inject, re inject. Excellent. Um, I, I've, I've seen uh, some comments about, uh, about um, the reported cases of, uh, of COVID patients who, who eventually developed uh, endophthalmitis. And uh, I think this was uh, discussed in, in the American Academy. Uh, and I want uh, to see uh, your opinion on, on, on those cases. Do you think that this is? Uh, something that we should be considering in cases of COVID uh, uh, positive patients uh, uh, with, with eye infection? Dr. Well, the Abdul. case that presented by Dr. Abdullah, it was a case of COVID that uh, admitted to the ICU. And uh, once the patient is getting recovered, he discovered that his vision in the left eye is uh, uh, poor in form of light perceptions. So uh, I think it's not exactly the uh, you know, the, the coronavirus by itself. It might be related to the, you know, intravenous injections and uh, catheters during the, you know, uh, intubations and uh, 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 in the ICU. This is maybe the cause of this, and it's a form of indigenous rather than to be anything else. Uh, uh, but uh, if I can yani, recall that there is no specific case haven't because uh, just only in a patient who's not been admitted to the, to the uh, or getting severe uh, corona infections. I don't know, maybe the others might be helping this. I'm not aware either of, um, you know, of the virus itself causing, uh, you know, obviously there is uh, some anterior segment uh, findings and uh, in the conjunctiva and so on, but endophthalmitis to be really, uh, uh, confirmed as just sole, the sole uh, infectious agent being the coronavirus, um, uh, I, I'm not aware uh, of, of such a case. I, I certainly didn't see one either. If you, if you allow me, uh, 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 Please. Uh, I, I add my voice to our colleague. I don't think there is any single publication of uh, uh, endophthalmitis because of that, I think the only came to the retina is uh, some sort of retinal vasculitis. And we have one of the cases uh, under publication in that matter, but uh, I haven't seen any publication talking about 
uh, uh, some sort of endophthalmitis picture in viral uh, infection. It can cause, if you go farther, uh, because you know coronavirus is is not a very strong virus. If you if you if you give it the worst scenario, it may get with the retinal necrosis rather than an endo, indigenous endophthalmitis picture. In, in my opinion, at least. Yes, please. Uh, usually, the viruses are intranuclear uh, organisms, so uh, the, the viruses cannot cause endophthalmitis. They can cause vasculitis or retinitis. So endophthalmitis, uh, there is no virus can cause endophthalmitis, regardless of COVID or other viruses. Thank you. Uh, so this is the last uh, question. It's a question and a comment. And I, I, maybe it was, it was uh, nice that that came from an anonymous attendee. Uh, the question was, um, uh, to what extent you still tap and inject every suspected case of endophthalmitis in the presence of the New York quinolone drops and others? And uh, which was not included in the EVS, uh, which is almost 20 to 25 years ago. Uh, I think this is, uh, this is a very nice uh, um, uh, question because I think we might have some of our colleagues in, uh, uh, who are not in the field who, who who think uh, in, in a way that might not be very similar to how we look at it. And I want to see everyone, uh, all of you, the, the panelists' uh, view on this question. Dr. Abud, maybe you can start. Um, well, I mean, uh, even in, in the presence of uh, uh, new uh, uh, drops, um, you know, here in, in the, the question is about the quinolones that could have a good penetration. Um, uh, I had not uh, until, uh, I mean, very recently, because really uh, um, I was at Cleveland until December uh, with a lot of intense activity, but I, we never changed that uh, intravitreal, intravitreal antibiotic that has to be delivered by injection. Um, is still the mainstay of the treatments. Um, Looking forward in the future uh, to uh, hopefully uh, confirm and ascertain that you really can use uh, only drops, uh, no matter with the, with their penetration and so on. But uh, right until now, um, it still has to be uh, intravitreal injection of antibiotics. Dr. Abdel Ghattani, uh, I'll leave the last comment for Dr. Hassan and Dr. Abdullah. Thank you for uh, for this wonderful uh, topics. And I totally agree, intravitreal injection is the main treatment. To me, intravitreal injection more important than a vitrectomy. To me, one drops or two drops over the surface of the eye is much, much, and much important than cleaning the eyelashes, eyelid, and the antibiotic post-op. Betadine, one drops, two drops, one times or two times over the eye. This is more important than giving antibiotic or than uh, trying to treat the patient uh, later on. Thank you. Thank you. So you, you, uh, this is uh, talking about the preparation of, of the of, for for any any procedure. Uh, uh, Dr. Saad Dehmed. So uh, just I have small comment um, for the general thermologists and the colleagues. Uh, the most important step of managing those cases is, uh, is how rapid you inject those uh, eyes with the antibiotic. So if you have the message I want to deliver, if you have a case of endophthalmitis, post cataracts, or post any procedure that you have, just inject. If you are afraid from tabbing and getting the sample, you are, you are not expert with the, getting the sample from the vitreous, no need to take sample. Just inject antibiotic and deflate the globe from the wound that you have in the cornea. So just deliver the antibiotic the sooner the, the possible. If you don't have the facility or the pharmacy that is well equipped with preparing the antibiotics that is well known by Comacy and Sifta, the commonest one, just take Vigamox 0.1 and inject in the vitreous without dilution and without even deflating the globe. So the sooner you give the antibiotic, the much uh, better the outcome will be, inshallah. Inshallah. Hassan? I'll, I'll leave the last comment for you, and we will we conclude them by this. Your mic is is not working, Dr. Hassan. Because I had my son is getting in the room a few minutes ago. <laughs> yeah. uh, if you're looking and putting back, where is the site for the replications or uh, of the uh, you know uh, organism? It is the vitreous. So uh, giving just only drops might not get 
the access to go to the fetal cavity. So it is for that reason the intrafetal antibiotic is an important tool to start with. Uh, sometimes might like lip related inflammations, okay, or infections not reaching the stage of endophthalmitis so that the fetus not yet starting to be involved, you might start your patient in topical medication under close observations. So you don't allow your patient to go home and getting it the second day. Put it in your hospitals and start your, and up on your assessment to see how things. So that's still not yet reaching the endophthalmitis stage, but it could be. Uh, but in case that the fetus is involved, my first, you know, advice, the standard gold is the uh, intrafetal injection of antibiotic. Uh, you know that as you're looking that now, we're starting to have, you know, uh, oral, you know, uh, 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 quinolone uh, uh, for treatment to add, an adjunct treatment for a lot of endophthalmites nowadays, regardless of the, you know, fetrectomy uh, endophthalmite study. So uh, this is might be help because you know uh, this is what I noticed now. Also, it is not recommended in all types of endophthalmites. And being that in the trial showed that you know the uh, systemic antibiotic is not helpful. But nowadays, because the penetrations of the antibiotic seem that it's safe uh, and oral treatment, especially in the severe types of endophthalmites. I don't know what Dr. Abud is assuming. No, I mean, uh, I, I, agree. I, I agree with you for sure. Uh, uh, in general, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the intravitreal injection of antibiotic, we all, we all agree on the importance, uh, utmost importance. And then, but there are uh, cases where we also decide to go for the intravenous antibiotics because uh, the efficacy of these antibiotics is different from what was used in the past, the, the vitreous availability is higher. Uh, so um, I would not fault anyone <clears throat> from, from uh, doing, I mean, I think we would all inject, uh, use the intravenous antibiotics also in traumatic endophthalmitis um, as well as bleb related endophthalmitis. Um, uh, but for the acute post-operative, um, it's not wrong if you don't. Uh, as long as you're doing the intravitreal injection of antibiotic. But if you use also intravenous, it's certainly uh, cannot be faulted, uh, particularly with the uh, most re more recent antibiotic agents, really. Yeah. Dr. Adil, uh, if you allowed me that I would like to thank you and Dr. Hazazi for really an, an excellent, great moderation of the uh, whole of the uh, webinars. I would like to extend my thanks for our really stars who's presented a great presentation and informative in the subject, which is an important for each ophthalmologist. Uh, thanks for the Saudi ophthalmology to give us this chance to be together. And special thanks for all of my colleagues who was with me in the panel, as well special thanks for Dr. Abboud, who is really kindly accepting our invitations and chance to see him all the times. Thank you very much, Dr. Ad. Mike, for you. Thank you, everybody. Okay, thank you very much. Thank, thank you, Karen. Stay safe. God bless. Bye bye. Thank you. <laughs>